Welcome to an introduction to educational research. Today's video is another single case research design called the Changing Criterion Design. I've said this several times, but just in case this is if you've just happened to stumble on this video and are watching it, there are times when a group experimental design is not possible where the researchers don't have access to a large enough population to draw a sample from and then to create a control, an experimental group, or it's just way too expensive. And so is a, a series of designs have been developed that are called single case research designs, and they are rigorous and they can establish internal validity and experimental control. And they are ideal for uses with small populations <coughs> or low incidence populations where you cannot have a uh, you cannot draw a sample and create experimental and control groups and this is one of those designs the changing criterion and to put it in perspective in the big picture here are types of educational research and we have the quantitative paradigm and the qualitative and we're over here, and we have under the quantitative, there are experimental and non-experimental. And we're over here under the experimental, and we're under the single case experimental, and we're down here with the changing criterion design. So let's take a look at some of the characteristics. The changing criterion design requires an initial baseline, just like any of the other single case designs on a single target behavior. And of course, we're looking for that baseline to stabilize in terms of level and trend, because then that means it's reached its natural level in the environment. And then uh, if we don't intervene or do anything, it'll stay at that level. And that's referred to as baseline logic. Now, once the baseline data has established, then the design it's followed by the implementation of a treatment, the independent variable, in each of a series of phases. So a series of phases are put in place in the design. And these phases are put in place before the design begins. And each treatment phase is associated with a stepwise change in the criterion rate for the target behavior. So prior to the research, the researcher scratches her, her head and says, OK, we're going to have six phases. Let's suppose the design is uh, someone who is having difficulty quitting smoking. And they take baseline data, and the person is smoking 30 cigarettes a day. And so the researcher, she says, OK, we're going to divide this up into seven phases. And we're going to set the criterion at different levels in each phase. So for the first phase, since the person is smoking 30 cigarettes a day, they can only smoke 25. And so the goal is set for 25 and then some kind of intervention, whatever the intervention is, positive reinforcement or payment for reaching the criterion, whatever. And then once the uh, participant levels off at 25 in phase one, then the second criterion comes in and the researcher prior to the research has established that it would be 20 cigarettes. And then the third phase, 15. So there's a stepwise change in the criterion that is subjectively set by the researcher prior to the research. Now each phase of the design provides a baseline for the phase to follow. So in the, in the example I gave, if the criterion was set for 25 at the first phase, the data has to level off at 25 in terms of its trend and level. Once that is done, then it's stable, then they can go to the next phase. <clears throat> so each phase serves as a baseline for the one that follows. When the rate of the target behavior changes with each stepwise change in the criterion level, the therapeutic change is replicated and experimental control or internal validity is determined. Establishing internal validity or experimental control using this design requires that each time the criterion level is changed, either increased or decreased, in our in the little example I gave you here, it was decreased because it was quitting smoking, there is a corresponding change in the dependent variable. 
So it's important when the criterion, when it moves to another phase and the criterion is changed, either lowered or higher, that the dependent variable moves to that level and stabilizes. This change in the dependent variable should be immediate and should follow a stable level and trend in the data in the preceding phase. So in other words, you don't move on to a phase until the data has stabilized in the preceding phase. It's very important to establish stability of the data before changing the criterion level. The reason, again, for this is that each phase serves as a baseline for the sub subsequent phase. Now, that might be a little different to, uh, to di digest and to visualize, but I'm going to show you a sort of an animated graphic that'll demonstrate the designs. Okay, so here we have a changing criterion design with hypothetical data illustrating the number of talkouts. So that's the dependent variable. We're going to be looking at the number of talkouts by a disruptive fourth grader during baseline and intervention. And the independent variable is free time on the computer. And it's made contingent upon changing criterion levels of performance. So in other words, this fourth grader is going to be given free time on the computer if they can reach the criterion level set. And we're trying to decrease their behavior of talkouts. So this, the y-axis, is the number of talkouts. And these are the sessions, or the days, so day 5, 10, 15, and so on. And these are baseline, and these are the different phases. And notice that the researcher, she has set the criterion levels already before the research begins. So the first phase, the student has to reduce talkouts to around 8 and the second phase around six, and the third phase around four, the fourth phase around two, and then finally none. So let's just take a look at the hypothetical. So here's the baseline data, and we looks like we have a nine, 10, eight, nine, and that's supposed to be nine. So the, da the data has stabilized pretty much. It's, it, the mean is probably nine. So now the criterion level in phase one is set for eight, and the student will get free time on the computer if they are able to reduce talkouts to about eight, averaging out about eight. So let's take a look. And they sort of do. They sort of do. This goes down to seven, but then these three are eight. So the data has stabilized. So now it's okay to move to the next phase. The criterion level has been set by the researcher for six. And lo and behold, the student averages about six. So the data is fairly stable. This is six, six, five, seven, six. So this would be an average of six. So it's okay to move to phase four, where the, I mean, where the phase three, the criterion level, is set at four. And the student does level out at four, and it's stable, so it's okay to move on. Now the criterion is set at 2, and the student comes down, actually below 2, which is even better, and then it's set at 0. And so that's how the design works. That's how the design works. So <clears throat> a baseline is taken, and criterion are set. In this case, we're looking to lower behaviors. So the criterion is set by the researcher prior to the research, if, in fact, in each phase, if the participant's data stabilizes around the criterion set for that phase, then that means that the criterion has been reached, and then you can move on to the next phase. And if, again, if it stabilizes again, then that's fine, and you could go on to the next phase, and so on and so on. If it doesn't stabilize in the phase, then... <coughs> The researcher should not then intervene and go into the next phase because there's no way of knowing because the data is not stabilized. You can read this on the side. It's basically just what we have talked about. Now, some from the, this might be your classroom and you might implement this design. It's fairly simple to implement. 
and this would be great, but from a researcher's point of view, they would really like to demonstrate experimental control because they're interested in creating uh, research strategies and methodologies that will work for all students or many students and can be generalized. So sometimes they will put a reverse in. So let me just give you an example of that. So this is baseline, phase one, phase two, phase three. Now in phase three, they raise the criterion back up to six, um, to eight, just to make sure that they could manipulate. So here the criterion was set for eight, the data stabilized. Here it was set for six, the data stabilized at six. Then they raised the criterion back up to eight to see if the data would go back up. Now this really demonstrates experimental control because every time they've changed the criterion, then the data went <coughs> and stabilized at the criterion. So this is really demonstrating control that free time on the computer is causing the change in the dependent variable, which is talkouts. But this is how the design is usually done the way we just talked about it from the classroom point of view without any reversal. If the data sort of looks like that in terms of reducing something, then we have established internal validity or experimental control. And of course, it could work the opposite. There might be behaviors we wanted to increase. So the baseline would be here and then criterions would be set a little higher and a little higher and a little higher and so on. Well, that's the design. It's fairly simple. So the, ch the advantages of the changing criterion design is intended to shape behaviors that exist in the participant's repertoire, but do not occur at a desirable rate. Either they need to be increased or decreased, but they need to exist, already exist. So the research history of the design indicates that it has been used to monitor programs in which motivational or compliance problems are responsible for the participant's failure to reach a specific competency, either increasing behaviors such as assignment completion or on-test behavior, or decreasing behaviors such as talkouts or out of seat, abusive language, quitting smoking, and things like that. It has the advantage of focusing only on one target behavior, and there's no reversal condition or withdrawal condition required. With its small step changes in criterion level, it may permit participant to change their behavior without being overwhelmed by an initial seemingly impossible criterion level, like quitting smoking. It's, um, as an ex-smoker, it's very difficult to quit just cold turkey. That's why we have, they have things like the patch now and things like that to sort of fade or reduce it a level at a time. Let's take a look at some of the disadvantages or the limitations. Generally, it can be limited to a relatively small range of target behaviors and instructional procedures. It's generally not appropriate to teach new academic skills or acquisition of skills. The design is limited to behaviors that are already in the subject's repertoire. Demonstration of experimental control or the internal validity depends on the subjective prediction of criterion levels by the researcher, which are established prior to the beginning of the research. So this could be a real limitation because the researcher is just sort of guessing. She's scratching her head and saying, well, I think we can do this, 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 and this. So the researcher must balance making criterion changes that are large enough to be detectable and small enough to be achievable or realistic. Okay. Oh, now it's your turn. Okay, consider the following statement below concerning the change in criterion design. And in writing, explain what this statement means and why it's important. So create a Word document. You know the drill. Save it under your name, underscore, and changing criterion design. So here's the prompt to react to. Establishing internal validity or experimental control using this design requires that each time the criterion level is changed, either increased or decreased, depending on what it is, 
there is a corresponding change in the dependent variable. This change in the dependent variable should be immediate and should follow a stable level and trend in the data in the preceding phase. It's very important to establish stability of the data before changing the criterion level. The reason for this is that each phase serves as a baseline for that subsequent phase. So what does that statement mean to you and why is it just important in terms of the change in criterion design? So you can write a little narrative about that. And then uh, I'm asking you to, for the second part to list five behaviors other than, what, than the ones presented here that a cha changing criterion design might be used for. And then put your responses in a Word document and email it please to me at happyjade1939 at yahoo.com. And again, if you are in the master's thesis program and you're thinking of a thesis, uh, doing a thesis in, in a classroom or something, a changing criterion might be an interesting design to take a look at if there are some behaviors uh, from some students that you have that need to be either increased or decreased. Well, thank you very much. Let's take a look at the resources. And again, if you have any comments, critiques, mistakes, just email us and let us know. And these are some of the resources. This particularly Tornian gas, it's a single subject research. This book is dated 1984, but uh, it was one of the classics in the field, a seminal text. All right, well, thank you very much, and we will see you next time.